We are live. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you with us this evening as we discuss some very important topics um, related specifically to the social climate we are currently experiencing in this country and how to move forward. Um, so we will be discussing the film. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to watch the film which is posted on YouTube, um, Angola, The Farm. Uh, and, it, and we will tie that into Black August and the 13th Amendment and the need to amend the 13th Amendment, which is our ultimate goal. So um, this evening, I would like to introduce you to our esteemed panelists who we are very thankful to have with us. And they include my co-moderator, Dr. Mikhail DeVoe, who is an activist, advocate, lecturer also at Nassau Community College, founder and executive director of Citizens Against Recidivism, Inc. Uh, Citizens' mission is to achieve the restoration of all the rights and attributes of citizenship among people with a history of justice involvement. Our panelists include uh, William Carter Jr., professor of law and former dean of the University of Pittsburgh School of Law, who is an expert on the history and jurisprudence of the 13th Amendment. Thank you for joining us, uh, Professor Carter. We also have Sister Sophia Elijah, a national, uh, nationally and internationally recognized attorney, excuse me, advocate and activist. She is also the executive director of Alliance for Families, Alliance of Families for Justice, AFJ. AFJ's mission is to mobilize, empower, and support social justice and social change initiatives by families of people who are incarcerated or who have criminal records. We also have attorney Alexis Hogue, a civil rights and criminal defense attorney, lecturer in law and inaugural practitioner in residence at the Eric Holder Jr. Initiative for Civil and Political Rights at Columbia University. Uh, we also have Professor Roderick Waltz, Watts, excuse me with us, Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the Graduate Center at the City of University of New York, City University of New York, excuse me. He is a community psychologist, a licensed clinical psychologist, and a fellow in the American Psychological Association and Society for Community Research and Action. Currently, he is the principal consultant at Action Research Associates in Atlanta. Um, and finally, we will have joining us shortly, Mr. Ashanti Witherspoon, who is the founder of Society of Servant Leaders and is a formerly incarcerated person who is also featured in the film, The Farm, Angola, USA, which is the center for our discussion this evening. So thank you once again for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. And um, at this time, I would like to pass the microphone to my co-moderator, Dr. DeVoe. Dr. DeVille, I think you might be muted. So again, uh, good evening all, and we're happy to join uh, our panelists and uh, you folks that are tuning in for what promises to be a very interesting discussion, I, I pray. I think I, the, the best thing for us to do is to begin with talking about uh, Black August. And if there's one theme that I would like us to remember as we think about the meaning of Black August, and it is the notion of uh, uh, resistance. Um, I thought about Black August from a personal perspective because among the things that I thought about during my time in incarceration was how to undo the process of institutionalization and uh, what psychological effect being in prison was having on me personally. Well, when you think about Black August, Black August originated in uh, the California prison system and it was um, a, an effort to remember some of the uh, men, freedom fighters who had fallen in their efforts to um, resist uh, the system that they were uh, 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 living under. And so in the commemoration of Black August during this time, of course, this is a time of collective grief, a time of, of, of rage and, and rebellion. We see all this in our current society. And you see um, uh, racial oppression, racial violence, all running through the street. And among the things that we are very much concerned with is 
is how this uh, commemoration of Black August as it uh, uh, remembers the resistance to enslavement. There's a history in August prior to the George Jackson death, the resistance and rebellion of people while they were incarcerated. Think of also the San Quentin Six. Think of, of things that were happening in Attica during the early 70s and how this as one of the uh, San Quentin Six said that, you know, it was a time for us to embrace principles of unity, self-sacrifice, political education, but resistance, resistance, resistance. And so among the things that um, uh, I think are very interesting, I'd like to get right into uh, talking to some of the, uh, 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 the panelists was um, uh, 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 questions about uh, uh, liberation, liberation psychology, political development as a means to uh, uh, address some of the structural issues that affected uh, people that had a history of justice involvement uh, and those that are, uh, are attempting to um, to mount uh, an effort to have the 13th Amendment amended. So uh, Dr. Watts, um, based on your experience as a, uh, a liberation psychologist, uh, one who's been involved as a scholar with social justice issues, uh, social political development, um, and, and, and thinking about the conflicting currents of uh, repression, resistance, uh, rebellion, reimagining. Um, how, how can you help us understand, you know, what we're currently experiencing and what we're currently trying to uh, resist and have change? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. DeVore, I appreciate that. And uh, so glad to see your face here. Uh, he and I have been, uh, uh, um, partners in crime for a few few years now. And, uh, uh, when he was doing his dissertation, I learned an awfully lot from uh, the di research he did on uh, formerly incarcerated um, men. So since we're uh, thinking about the uh, remembrance of George Jackson, I'd just like to quote a bit from a um, uh, video that's uh, online uh, where he talks a little bit about his experience. And he said, uh, at the very end of the uh, video, he said, uh, I've gotten, I've been hungry too long. Um, I've gotten angry too often. I've been lied to and insulted too many times. They push me over the line for which there can be no retreat. If I live here, leave here alive, I will leave nothing behind. There will be nothing um, to see and they will, but they will not count me among the broken men. And when I think, thought about, when I think about the movie, um, The Farm, I think it's so obvious it's one of the most violent institutions, if not the most violent institution in this country. And its aim is to break the people, men and women, who spend time there. And uh, what I like about what we're doing here today is we're thinking about in many ways the opposite of that is as um, Dr. DeVos said, we want to uh, cultivate resistance uh, and resilience, but I put resistance first. And even though I, uh, a lot of my uh, ideas around um, uh, resistance came when I was thinking about liberation psychology, I, I soon found that psychology it can only deal with a part of the issues we're talking with here. And I now think about it as really liberation studies and action, the both intellectual part, but also the action part. And really trying to keep those two as close together uh, as we can. Because I know for myself and I know about the lawyers here that when I finished my degree as a clinical psychologist, I had to take the next few years unlearning at least one third of what I learned in graduate school, uh, if I were to work with um, people of African descent in this country, because much of it was uh, uh, irrelevant. But some still stuck with me because I believe in thinking about resistance, we need to think about internalized oppression and specifically internalized racism. And we have theories uh, in psychology, uh, particularly those by um, William Cross, 
and uh, Robert Sellers about the social and political development of black people politically from essentially uh, seeking to be, uh, seeing everything as white, as ideal and everything as black, as um, unwanted to developing the kind of revolutionary ideas that Jackson and others um, talked about during, the, during their period of uh, incarceration. Now, I'm not expecting us all to come out here being revolutionary, uh, um, doing revolutionary resistance, but we need to think about whose voices we need to lift up in thinking about the 13th Amendment and all the other uh, structural barriers that face men in and men and women in prison, but also when they leave um, prison to rebuild their lives. And for me in particular, I'm thinking it's gonna take something like a movement uh, to make a change. And that's sort of an understatement though, isn't it? Uh, a movement to change the 13th Amendment. And the most recent and arguably accessible, uh, successful effort so far has been the ERA Amendment. And you know, if you know that's still alive and, and kicking. And so we need to think not just about the intellectual aspects of these issues and the ways in which they are, have been reproduced a slavery over the centuries. We need to think about how this movement should look and how we can bring, especially grassroots, uh, formerly incarcerated people into the movement and into the movement at the base of the movement, not after others have decided what the issues are, what the priorities are, and what we should focus on. So even though um, I'm talking about all this issue, all these issues around structural uh, violence and racism, I think as a psychologist, I've learned that one of the most important things is to link personal development and community development. Because if you don't have a stable a platform from which to work, you're gonna have a very difficult time dealing with the stresses and the dangers of doing movement politics. So yes, all through the process of doing community building and doing personal development, there will be a threat that's political, but as folks who I think who've spent time in prison, which I have not, but I know a number of folks who have, there's a lot of things you're going to have to deal with when you get out of prison. Trauma that uh, we, you probably experienced to one degree or another before you came to prison. Mm -hmm. The trauma that happened while you're in prison. The mental disorders or substance abuse disorders you may have uh, developed before, after, or, or maybe risk of when you get out. All these sorts of issues are personal development issues, not to mention getting back, if you can, reconciling with your family. Uh, trying to reconnect with your partner, if that's something you're interested in, and trying to deal with your children, all these things um, don't need to be put, you know, lined up like ducks in a row, but have to be in a place where there's enough, um, let's say, let's say, um, uh, uh, um, leftover energy to be able to deal with political work. So, when I think about this, a lot, of, a lot of models are around that can, can develop now with trauma. There's been a lot of breakthroughs around understanding trauma, a much better understanding of that. There's a lot of research that's been done by black psychologists to help us think. One of them is the emotional emancipation circles that the Association of Black Psychologists developed and, and, uh, and created a, um, a, um, a nonprofit to do this around the world. They've been in in parts of Africa as well as the US, working with African Americans around issues of internalized oppression, internalized racism, and a rejection of their own uh, culture as uh, um, diasporic Africans. So there's a lot of stuff that can be moved to scale. It hasn't, but it's available. So we don't really need to talk about what to do and how to do it, but we need the resources to make these things happen. And I know from um, 
from reading uh, Mikhail uh, DeVoe's work uh, in his dissertation that many of the men coming out of prison were interested in civic engagement. They're interested in being involved in giving back. I've worked with the Amity Foundation who has some amazing programs in um, California where they have uh, men who are lifers uh, and were on death row. They were managed to get them out, several of them out uh, for in a variety of strategies and they become mentors for folks coming out of prison. And they don't do individual therapy, they do what they do, community uh, therapy. And they have people who work in the community who've been incarcerated before work with those who are coming out. They actually have a community there and in a few other um, uh, states as well. So we have a lot around that we can do both politically and around the psychological and wellness aspects that, that people uh, have to deal with in, uh, when they get out of prison. But back to the to the to the uh, issues of structural um, structural change. How are we going to structure ourselves uh, and, and and structure the, the the various stakeholders in this issue in a way and the allies that we need to make this happen? One of the things I've been doing recently uh, in the last seven years or eight years, and you let me know now, uh, Mikhail, when I got about two minutes left or so. Okay. Um, I've been working with youth community organizing groups, uh, people of color in California, 24 um, organizations doing youth um, uh, community uh, uh, organizing, which means training young people to do the organization. And many of these young people have had some run-ins with the, with the uh, uh, law, but have found a new way to focus some of their indignation and their anger and channel it around political work. And they're doing some uh, considerable amount of work in the um, criminal justice systems, uh, the uh, pipeline from school to, um, to prison and so forth. And obviously uh, um, prevention is the best thing, but I think we need to um, sort of follow in, in the steps of uh, George uh, Jackson in thinking about how can we politicize um, folks who aren't already politicized after they get out of prison but also think about all the other aspects I mentioned in their lives that don't have to be perfect, but have to be at least stable in order for them to begin thinking about civic and political engagement. So I'm really interested in those things. I look forward to uh, somewhere down the line, us uh, having this discussion. Let me, let me add one thing to, 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 I call, when you were mentioning these models, the model that I have embraced for uh, this type of, I'll just call it politicization, I call it the George Jackson model. And I call it the George Jackson model because George Jackson went to prison as a petty criminal, but it was via his interaction with people like Angela Davis that he began to develop a, a, a heightened sense of awareness or became politicized and began to see his personal situation in a broader context. That was because he was having conversation with people in the community. So as you were talking about um, uh, um, these models and how do we get people to a state of belief, for me it's efficacy before agency. You know, they first have to believe that they can. And so it's via this conversation, this interaction with our own because we expect our own to tell us the truth. And for me, it was the same process because one of the things that I was doing in prison was reading slave books to try to understand the incarceration experience. And then I began to understand that there was a process of institutionalization that was similar to, to the seasoning of a slave so that one could develop a mental uh, a, a state of thinking where they believed that the, 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 the construction, the social construction, the reality that they found themselves in was the way it was supposed to be. Now we're having these conversations to suggest that, no, you can remake your situation. Like among the things that uh, Black August encourages us to do is to reimagine. That's all up here. And I began to understand that the, the, the incarceration experience or the experience of institutionalization was more than just holding the person physically. It was, as you said, mind bending, will breaking, hollowing out men and perhaps women. And so among the things that I talk about, or at least that I discovered is that 
what people were trying to do was to uh, undo what had been done. And I kind of called it the institutionalization process because in prison, something is happening to the individual as a result of being in this, this, this structure, being in this system. And it's the same thing whether it, to me, to some degree, whether in prison or out, because they want the men to come out of prison, what I call appropriately deferential, bowing and just, I uh, guess, uh, uh, you know, uh, having internalized the place that they had been assigned. So that's why I thought, you know, this, this, this stuff about, you know, uh, 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 liberation psychology was very important in terms of helping us free ourselves from, you know, uh, 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 the you know, how we had been institutionalized or even made into a slave. You know, you had to make a person, people aren't born slaves, they had to be made into a slave. It's the same type of, of, of making into something, you know, that, that, that really benefits the system rather than benefit the people themselves. So I, I thought the point that you were making and how do we do, and you have to, like you say, you know, encourage those that have been, you know, most, you know, that have been in this thing, they have to be heavily involved in undoing what has been done. Right, exactly. So uh, is Mr. Witherspoon available? Yeah, no? Uh, it appears he hasn't been able to join us yet. Uh, he did say that he would be in a few minutes late. Um, so, Dr. DeVoe, I believe you can uh, direct your questions to Professor Carter. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Carter, among all of us, is more of the quote-unquote expert, you know, in terms of helping us, you know, move from a, a scholastic kind of atmosphere and realm and, and help explain you know uh the significance and importance of the 13th amendment and um it's 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 relationship to, to race and color perhaps even class and a whole bunch of other things so um uh professor carter um as we begin to understand you know the infrastructure the customs the practices the systems the form of you know, racial subordination that have uh, supported this ideology of white supremacy, you know, which has enabled the system of slavery to prosper and to persist, you know, beyond the simple outlawing of chattel slavery, you know, the frame is they also intended the amendment to, to uh, address some of the, uh, um, how do they frame this, uh, the, 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 the badges and incidents the vestiges of, of, of the slavery, you know, given your understanding of the 13th Amendment as an anti-racist constitutional kind of moment, exactly what, you know, what should we make of the, the absence of the, uh, uh, in the text regarding the 13th, mention, uh, 13th Amendment mention of color and race and, you know, how does that, how does that, or what impact do you think that it might have on the conversation and the movement of what it is we're trying to do to have the, uh, the punishment clause uh, uh, abolished or eliminated from that amendment. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, and thanks all of you for having me. I really appreciate being a part of this conversation. Um, and I should say just right off the, off the bat, listening to Dr. Watson, Dr. DeVoe, I've learned a lot um, just from this brief part of the conversation. So I know this is gonna be a really great event. Um, so a few preliminary thoughts, and then I'll kind of work my way to the specific question that you posed. Um, the first thing that I wanted to note is when we, we think about the Constitution um, as a body of law, it has both uh, a functional aspect and what some scholars call an expressive aspect. So laws do certain things, but they also convey certain meanings and values. Okay. The, the second thing that's worth keeping in mind when thinking about constitutional interpretation is uh, your frame of reference makes a big difference in terms of the values that you bring to the table in the interpretive task. So, um, for example, I teach first year constitutional law and I'll often have conversations with students about what the framers intended a particular constitutional provision to mean. And my first question will be, well, are we bound by the past, let's talk about that. And secondly, if we are uh, bound by the past, the question is who's past? 
So when someone says the framers intended X, my first response is, well, which framers? The framers who held human beings as slaves or who compromised in American slavery if they didn't have slaves themselves, or the post-Civil War framers who at least within the best of their ability as people of their time, did indeed intend to create what scholars call a second founding of the nation. One that rather, being based, rather than being based on principles of enslavement would be based on principles of freedom. Okay, so my research into the 13th Amendment very much indicates that those framers by the post-Civil War amendments intended to change the, the fundamental principles of American government and American society to that point. The idea that um, humans uh, were a form of chattel property whose labor could be reaped for the benefit of others without any compensation to them, but also, as you mentioned, to dismantle what those framers called the badges and incidents of slavery. That is the supporting societal and governmental structures that made human enslavement possible. Mm -hmm. So the conflation of race with criminality and uh, being subject to inherent suspicion of wrongdoing because of who you are was a means of social control over slaves and blacks. The inability to own or acquire property on equal terms unequal treatment before the courts of justice, the uh, constant fear of being subject to private violence with impunity without the protection of the law. All of these surrounding and interlocking systems are what made enslavement of human beings possible. Uh, and as you said, Dr. DeVoe, no one is born a slave. You, you make a slave, right? And individual interactions between the owner and the enslaved person are not themselves alone enough to accomplish that. There has to be a surrounding systemic infrastructure that reinforces that uh, status that is foisted upon the person. Now, as to um, the 13th Amendment itself, just uh, one thing I wanted to mention as we're thinking about the punishment clause, um, and that's not my specific area of expertise, but I've read a bit about it. And there are a couple of ways to think about the punishment clause. The dominant narrative, I would say, is that the punishment clause was adopted and intended to allow re-enslavement by another name, okay? I am no longer convinced that that's true. That, that was my understanding for a long time. Um, but I've read some recent excellent work, um, a professor named Tajania Henderson at Rutgers and a professor named James Pope at Rutgers uh, as well, recently wrote some work questioning that common narrative about the punishment clause. That narrative, they argue, that is that being incarcerated removes the protection of the 13th Amendment from you was actually not the original intent of the framers who wrote the 13th Amendment or those who ratified it. Rather, that was a reactionary narrative that was pushed by uh, the former slave owners and slave owning states to try to maintain control over uh, the newly freed persons after the Civil War. And so I, wonder while supporting the idea of amending the 13th Amendment for clarity, right, to make clear that the punishment clause does not allow uh, the enslavement of persons even if they are incarcerated. I worry about ceding the rhetorical ground that that's what the 13th Amendment intended in the first place. I, I would not um, be so quick to accept that. I think there's a lot of evidence that the punishment clause was purposely overread and misused by those who wish to uh, return people to a condition of enslavement. But that doesn't mean that that is what it was originally intended to be. Um, the last thing I'll say in this regard more directly to your question is when we think about constitutional text in particular, there are always questions about uh, what words are included or not included and what they're signaling, uh, what I referred to it earlier as the expressive function of the law. So one natural reaction to reading the 13th and the 14th Amendment is that if they were intended um, to adopt an anti-subordination, anti-racist framework to protect a group of people, African-Americans who had been enslaved, why don't they ever speak of race specifically in the text? And I would say there are a few reasons for that. First, the framers of the 13th Amendment were operating from an understanding that the system of American slavery had since its early beginnings always been race-based. It was impossible to separate in American society, at least as slavery developed here, race from enslavability. 
Okay, so they wouldn't have felt the need to specifically refer to the race because they understood what we had created was a racialized caste system by virtue of en enslavement. So that's one reason. The other reason is um, to use the, a, a term that some of you would be familiar with if you're familiar with uh, critical race theory is that this is an instance of what Professor Derek Bell called interest convergence. So in fact, the 13th Amendment's framers wanted to rectify as best they could the subordination of the newly freed slaves, but they also thought of slavery itself as having distorted American society. So the abolitionists um, whose views influenced the 13th Amendment's framers to a great degree often use this phrase that um, a chain has shackles at both ends. That is the, the enslavement you inflict upon another human being damages you. The violence you inflict upon them binds you to them. And so they did in fact want to make sure that the system of enslavement and the structures that allowed it would be eliminated for all time as to all persons, not only African-Americans and the descendants of the enslaved. So that, that's the other reason why the term um, race and color may not have been used in the 13th Amendment. But I'll say this and um, then I'll, I'll stop this part of my remarks. That should not be mistaken for a belief that the post-Civil War framers embrace this notion of constitutional colorblindness that we see in so much of the um, jurisprudence and jargon on the right. They were race conscious. They understood that slavery had become about race and race had become about slavery. They adopted a variety of race conscious measures to try to rectify the condition of the former enslaved, formerly enslaved. So in a lot of modern day Supreme Court cases, um, the court turns to, well, these words don't speak about any particular race and therefore they must be interpreted equally as to all persons. And therefore things like affirmative action are unconstitutional because they disadvantage white people in a way that's not colorblind. Nothing could be further from the truth in terms of the post-Civil War framers' intent. Those amendments are race conscious, even though their language does not speak specifically in terms of race. What I find interesting in the conversation is that, you know, the language of the 13th Amendment is the same language that was used in the Northwest Ordinance in 17. Right. Uh, and to me, it seemed to, um, the, the theme for me, seems to suggest that they're concerned of what are we gonna do about these people of African descent. Among the problems that comes up in the, in, in the discussion is the, uh, the linking of, of slavery and involuntary servitude. Some people make the argument that these are just semantic, sem you know, semantic differences. Uh, you know, how, do, how do we, um, and also the same language is used in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we have the same language running through a lot of conversation, but they seem to, as you say, you know, evidence um, uh, uh, race consciousness, even though it's not framed that way. So I, I, I'm just, I'm just a little, I, you know, in trying to understand it because it's very important for us to kind of dig deep and try to understand, you know, what the intent of the people that put these statements out were, but. Often, as we see, you know, the way the thing is actually perceived becomes the reality. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So actually, right today, what we're dealing with, as we also are trying to understand the intent, but we also, we, we're, we're acutely confronted with the perception, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, that this is what this is really all about. How do, you, how do we respond yeah. to, I mean, how do we, how do we unravel this, this, this kind of a confusion so that when our efforts to amend the 30th Amendment, the reasons why we're trying to do that is, is communicated clearly to lay people. Because that's, you know, among the things that we have to get on board are, as Dr. Watts said, you know, the grassroots people, former incarcerated people, because all they're going to see it is they're going to see, I believe, as I saw, you know, the race, uh, uh, as, the racial aspects of, of, of this, of this, of the conversation. Yeah, so I'll offer a couple of um, brief thoughts there. So uh, you put your finger on a couple of things that I think are quite important. How do you seek to establish legal meaning in a way that advances social justice is a big question that many, many people have thought about for many years. I'll say this, 
One thing we've learned from studying law and social movements is that the law tends to follow culture rather than to change it. And therefore, if you wish to first change the law, you must first change the culture. There's a lot of research from political scientists, for example, that demonstrates that the uh, Supreme Court, even in highly contentious cases, Brown versus Board of Education, uh, Roe versus Wade, seldom tends to get out in front of public opinion. More often, they are following public opinion. Okay, it may not always be visible that that is what is happening, but more often than that, that tends to be what's happening. Secondly, in the area of race, one way to shape that public opinion and therefore kind of change the cultural environment in which our courts are making decisions is to find these points of interest convergence. So as Professor Bell said, and a lot of people crit criticized him for being pessimistic, I just think it's realistic, um, that advances in black civil rights in America seldom come about out of altruism or idealism, right? things tend to change when the white empowered majority sees that it's in their own interest to change, right? And so part of the way you change that culture is looking for those moments of interest convergence. I would also say though that um, one thing that I have become acutely aware of when we talk about the law is that we as lawyers, and, and this reminds me of what you and Dr. Watts were saying at the beginning, um, we think hierarchically and we think from the position of an elite. So in the system of law, you're generally bound by precedent. What happened yesterday controls what happens today unless there's some strong reason not to follow it. And secondly, it's hierarchical because some higher authority has declared a precedent and I, whether I'm a lower court or a lawyer, am bound to follow it, okay? That's the way lawyers think. There is a field of study in the law um, that, that challenges those underlying notions and says, well, um, who are we leaving out if we view the development of the law in that way, we're leaving out the grassroots. So in the case of um, the 13th Amendment and the law of slavery, one thing that I have only fairly recently, maybe in the last four or five years, started to do is to explicitly rely upon slave narratives of Black people who lived under this system and start my research and advocacy from this question. What did they think the law meant. Now, it doesn't make them right. It doesn't mean I have to accept what people who lived 150 years before me thought, but it very much changes our approach to understanding legal meaning if instead of always and only relying upon a hierarchy, we look to the people who were affected by the law as agents of their own liberation and ask what meaning would they give. So, if you were to ask an enslaved person whether they believed that the 13th Amendment in the year 2020 should be interpreted in a way that allows incarcerated persons to be forced to work for nominal pay, they would say absolutely not. It wouldn't even be a question to them that the 13th Amendment shouldn't operate in that way because what they experienced was a, a system that in many ways was very similar to that and they wouldn't have intended for it to be perpetuated. So I think that as we're thinking about how to operationalize a um, more uh, liberational oriented view of the 13th Amendment, we have to think about courts as agents of the culture rather than the opposite. We have to think about whose meaning we're privileging when we're talking about what the law means in our culture. And the last thing I'll say is this, we need to think beyond the courts. And I, I know we'll talk about this, um, but there's a great book called The Hollow Hope uh, by a law professor named Jerry Rosenberg, who's I think was at the University of Chicago, which basically boils down to this, um, put not your faith in judges to give you justice. There are many levers and courts are just one of them. There are legislatures, there are city councils, there's public protests, there's direct action. If we, those of us who are interested in social justice fall into the habit of believing that judges are gonna solve all our problems, we are always going to lose. I think that's a good opportunity to bring in uh, uh, Sister Neff, <laughs> you know, because, um, uh, uh, I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure a lot of us remember Mumia Abu-Jabal, who wrote the book called The Jailhouse Lawyer's Manual. And when asked the question, what is the law? He said, the law is what the white man says the law is. <laughs> so it's predicated again. And it's the same thing when we think about the word or the concept of history. 
we generally get this concept from the victors, from the people that won, and we don't entertain the perspective of other actors or other people that were involved. So well said, you know what I mean? And, and we have to write that. I hope, I hope our audience is also taking notes because I'm yeah. taking notes because we're, again, we're, we, we, the, the, the process that we're engaged in now is basically education. You know, we have to understand or, 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 or a heightened sense of awareness, politicization, consciousness, you know, some uh, 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 an understanding before we can actually organize and mobilize. So I think that this is one of the, one of the very first important steps before we can take any kind of action. Neff, thank, thank you, you. Yes. thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank Professor you. Carter. Thank you so much. Thank you for um for that excellent breakdown. Uh, if you guys are just joining us, you've missed a good portion, but it's not too late because we still have a lot left to go. And I know that this discussion is going to be continue to be very enlightening. So we're, we're gathered here once again. If you're just joining us, we're gathered here to discuss the 13th Amendment and its real life um, applications today and, and how it lends or how it contributes to our current social climate. You know, we've in the past few months as in the past few years have been experiencing quite a bit of social unrest as a result of criminal injustice, right? Um, and so people have questions. How do we go about changing this? And so we started off with Professor Watts explaining some of the psychological aspects of what imprisonment and slavery was intended to and then actually has done. Um, and then we just had a great um, legal analysis from um, pr the professor there. So um, I would like to give special thanks once again, if you're just joining us, uh, please note that this presentation has been brought to you by Columbia University. Special thanks to professors uh, Kendall Thomas and Flores Forbes. We also have the Citizens Against Recidivism who are actively fighting to um, bring justice to people who have served time um, and have been formally incarcerated. I'd also like to extend thanks to the Lift Every Voice Coalition for Justice and the Complete Abolition Movement. And then this presentation is one of uh, the first of many presentations that will be brought to you by a newly birthed movement, which is a synthesis of all of the aforementioned, um, the Amend the 13th movement. And so we're here to, as Dr. DeVoe just said, educate the public. We want everybody to know the ins and outs of what we're discussing and then how to move forward. Um, for a long time, we've simply been having uh, theoretical discussions on you know, the social implications or what it is that we feel, the sentimental aspects of these types of movements. But here today, we would also like to incorporate some tips as to how to move forward. And so my next question then goes to attorney Alexis Hogue. Thank you once again for joining us, um, attorney Alexis. Um, so the question is, the 13th amendment is one of three amendments to the US constitution, which along with the 14th and 15th make up the Reconstruction's am reconstruction amendments, which were added to the federal constitution between 1865 and 1870. Uh, the, during the five years immediately after the Civil War. What, what utility do you see, Attorney Alexis, in returning to the social and historical context of the Reconstruction Amendments in seeking redress for Black people in the current moment? So how basically, how can history and social context help in reconstructing the 13th Amendment, um, the constitutional regime that enables the use of forced prison labor. As an attorney and an advocate, what utility do you see in appealing to what Professor Dorothy Roberts has called abolition constitutionalism as a mobilizing frame for the movement to end prison slavery? Great, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you to Columbia and particularly my colleague at, um, at the law school, Kendall Thomas, for inviting me to participate in this very rich conversation. Um, I recently transitioned into academia uh, from practice. And I started uh, as an assistant federal public defender in Nashville, Tennessee for about 10 years where I represented men who had been sentenced to death in the state system and uh, they sought their relief. Um, I represented them in federal court and I transitioned to the legal defense fund where I was able to sort of take a step back and look at many of the issues that I encountered from more of a macro level. Um, and I had the ability to be a little bit more creative about my advocacy and seek systemic change. And something that I began to do while I was at the Federal Defenders and when I started to do more at the Legal Defense Fund was to provide social and historical context uh, for the lives of my clients to give the decision makers, at this point it was judge, not a jury, 
a reason to spare my, my client's life. Um, and now that I've transitioned into the law school, I'm, I'm, I'm now charged with sort of shaping and encouraging and inspiring these young minds to, to go out and do some of this social justice work. Um, and all of this has become so much more urgent. And as Black people, we feel uh, the atrocities and the compounded trauma and the grief of, of these, the law enforcement killings, but th these have been going on for centuries. And what I want to spend the 10 or so minutes on here is to talk about slavery's direct legacy on the criminal legal system. Uh, this explosion, this idea of Black citizenship, recognition really of Black citizenship during these Reconstruction Amendments, and then to talk about this concept of equal protection of the law. So I wanna lean a little bit heavier on the 14th Amendment um, because I know Dr. Carter did such a good job on the 13th and he's really the expert there, uh, but I will touch on, on all three of the amendments. Um, and I'm, I'm so glad that you introduced uh, Dorothy Roberts' work, Abolition Constitutionalism, because she really sets up sort of this framework. She, 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 she argues that there is both a utility and a futility to return to history. And obviously I fall into the utility camp. Um, I do think it breathes life into some of these, uh, these issues. And, and, and she ultimately argues that both are useful and it's, it's helpful for us to, to examine um, the past and, and what was achievable then and what wasn't achievable as we look today to abolish these systems of systemic racism um, that affect primarily black people, uh, but of course affect uh, so many people of color. And although the film that we, that we all saw in Angola um, is in Louisiana, there are prisons like that all over the country. Many of my clients, um, when I was at the Legal Defense Fund, were confined at Parchman, which is a prison, the Mississippi State Prison. It was built in 1901, so obviously uh, after um, slavery, but uh, it was modeled after a plantation. And so the, um, the, the, the head of the prison was very much like sort of the, the, the master of, of a plantation and the overseers uh, were the correctional officers that rode on horseback very much like the, some of the imagery that we saw in the film in Angola. Uh, some of my clients in Tennessee before they were on death row were at um, what was called the farm in Tennessee, it was in West Tennessee. And so these, these um, institutions exist in multiple states. They might look a little different in California but they serve the very same feature which is again to exploit the, the labor uh, and, it, and, and really remove mostly men, but of course women now are the fastest growing prison population, but remove whole populations of people uh, from, their, from their communities um, and really continue to control and monitor mostly black people uh, in the West. Uh, the numbers of Latinx are quite high as well. Um, and and as, as Dr. Carter did recognize, Professor Carter, uh, it wasn't just slavery, it was the racial hierarchy. He, he referenced caste. Um, and those of you that are visual learners, I have a lot of books around me that I'll hold up. Um, but if you have not seen Isabel Wilkerson's brand new book, Cast, uh, this just came yes, out this year. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and, I, and I highly, highly recommend this because it, it, it wasn't just the institution of slavery. It was the fact that there was a complete subordination of a whole population of people based on their identity, uh, based on their race, based on their ethnicity. And that is what we still see disdain of today. Um, and that's what we see in that sharp juxtaposition between the way that um, James Blake was treated by the police officers in Kenosha and uh, Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, so it's that racial hierarchy, that caste that is still with us today. Um, there's a number of other authors that have written on this. I wanna, I wanna hold up another one, Khalil Muhammad, um, The Condemnation of Blackness. And he talks about the way that statistics were collected um, largely beginning in the early 1900s to document um, crime was really in a way to um, identify primarily black people as the perpetrators of crime, whereas white people were committing crimes as well. Uh, but really the way that, that the government collected statistics, the way that, that, that states collected statistics was really to solidify um, this subordination of black people. And so that, you know, out of, out of slavery, um, we really have this presumption of criminality and dangerousness that is now assigned um, automatically now uh, to people with black and, and brown skin. And we see the way that that plays out. Um, I wanna talk briefly before we get the reconstruction amendments, uh, what were they responding to? They were responding to these early American laws during the colonial period and after 
um, that really created a hierarchy uh, within the criminal codes. Uh, they were known as slave codes. And so what uh, the type of conduct um, that would occur, it would be deemed criminal based on the race of the perpetrator and based on the race of the victim. And if it was a black perpetrator who struck a white person and drew blood, that was a crime punishable by death. If a white person struck a black person, that was not deemed a, a crime. Uh, there was no mechanism within the laws, within the slave codes, that would allow any sort of redress. And in fact, the, the, the provision of the laws that would allow for some sort of redress were found within property law. So there could be reimbursement of a white person for lost property if their, if their, their enslaved person was damaged or reimbursement for a complete loss of property if their enslaved person was killed. And so really the reconstruction amendments were responding to the complete lack of, of, of personhood of black people. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case in 1857. So now we're just a couple of years before emancipation, uh, Dred Scott. And he, uh, Dred Scott versus uh, Sanford, and he was attempting to bring members of his family uh, to, to him in, in, a, in, a, in a territory that was not, did not practice enslavement. And so he petitioned the US Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court said, ah, we don't really have jurisdiction. You're not actually a person. Uh, as, as a black, uh, as a black formerly enslaved person, you, our, our constitution, they the framers, did not envision to even recognize you as a, as a person. And so I really want us to think about the reconstruction amendments. And I know that uh, Professor Carter used the term as a second founding. I, I wanna say he borrowed that from Eric Fawner, uh, who is, is the go-to on um, reconstruction and understanding uh, sort of the, the, the political transformation that our country went through. Uh, whole chapters devoted to each of the amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th. Um, this is a book that came out just a couple years ago, his earlier one, which I also recommend, Reconstruction, the updated, I have the updated edition, but he's, he's done a few. But it's this, it's this explosive period of our country where for the very first time, Black people are recognized as citizens and entitled to an equal protection of the law. And I'm speaking about the 14th Amendment. And I want to spend a little bit of time on that uh, with, the, with the time that I have left. Um, in my practice, um, representing men who had been sentenced to death, seeking relief for them in federal court, um, I, I, I wanted to, to find more creative tools to sort of think about you know, how, how, to, uh, how to dismantle not just uh, the death sentence that my one client was facing, but let, let me think sort of more expansively about, about challenging the death penalty. And so I, I recently wrote a piece called Valuing Black Lives, a case for ending um, abolishing the death penalty. And it was through a use of the 14th Amendment. And so I returned to the history of the formation of the 14th Amendment. And, and Dr. Uh, Professor Carter spoke about returning to the primary documents that the actual narratives of enslaved people, Sadia Hartman does this in her scholarship. And I encourage you to seek her work out. But I, I too return to the primary documents. And so there is um, a, a hearing, the Joint Reconstruction Committee. Uh, these are bodies of Congress that were meeting together in January of 1866 to hear testimony from individuals, um, stakeholders in the South. So it was mostly union uh, generals and officials that, that were still occupying the former Confederate states. And this joint committee of Congress asked them to come to DC and to provide testimony about the state of the Negro. And you can Google 39, it's the 39th Congress, the Joint Reconstruction Committee, and you can pull up this entire document, hundreds of pages. And it was led, uh, I mean, there were, there were a handful of legislatures there, uh, but John Bingham from Ohio, Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania, and they heard testimony after testimony after testimony about the fact that black people were being murdered, maimed, raped, assaulted with impunity in the former Confederate States. And when the, the, the Congress people asked, well, why, why don't they go to the local judge? Why don't they go to the, um, you know, whatever, whatever official in town? And the people providing testimony scoffed at this idea that a black person could, could somehow seek redress from the legal system that had been set up in this country. And so again, this is hundreds of pages of testimony, weeks of hearings. 
that they're just hearing these reports that black people are being murdered and maimed, slaughtered with impunity. The Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, Brian Stevenson's organization re recently issued an updated lynching report focusing on reconstruction. So this period between 1865, 1866 and 1877 and documented over 2000 additional lynchings that EJI uh, hadn't, hadn't previously researched before. I mean, this was, this was widespread. And so at the conclusion of this hearing, you had John Bingham from Ohio actually drafting the words that we know of as the Equal Protection Clause. And the concept of the 14th Amendment was to provide equal, extend equal protection of the laws to Black people who had just earned their citizenship. So the 13th Amendment, yes, abolished slavery. It was the first time the Constitution had mentioned slavery was in the 13th Amendment. It gave Congress the power to pass additional laws because it wasn't going to just be, you know, we can take away the chains and everything will be fine. It was like, no, Congress has to be empowered to pass laws to, to offer further protection, to get rid of the badges and the incidents of slavery. The 14th Amendment was to provide equal protection of the existing laws that didn't already protect these newly created citizens. And the 15th, of course, um, extended the right to vote. And so there was this bright period, this 12 year bright period reconstruction that Eric Fawner um, has, so, has so copiously studied. Uh, but we know there was a massive uh, retraction. And uh, you know, Derek Bell writes, uh, not just about interest convergence, but this idea that racism, uh, there's a permanence to racism and that any sort of progress is a temporary peak of progress to be followed uh, by, by, a, by a valley of, of um, sort of retraction. Um, but the other thing that Derek also says, Professor Bell, the late Bell, is that there is value in the struggle against the hierarchy, against um, oppression. And so we continue, obviously, to fight on. Um, but during this period, after Reconstruction, you, ha you have the slave codes, Black laws were right, right following the, the, the Civil War. And then you enter this long period of Jim Crow, uh, which formally uh, was disbanded with the Supreme Court's decision in 1954. But um, there was still remnants, obviously, of, 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 of segregation. And obviously, we still experience the racial hierarchy today in 2020. But uh, to return us to this period after Reconstruction, um, you had these vague sort of uh, laws, vagrancy laws that were, that were used to virtually re-enslave black people. Before the Civil War, prisons were full of mostly white people. Uh, black people were far more valuable as enslaved individuals. After slavery was abolished, black people filled the prisons. Um, and so I hope in all of, all of my comments here, you, 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 you can hear the parallels of the system we operate today compared to the system that, that came out shortly after um, emancipation. And, and the link that I draw is with capital punishment. Um, and there's so much more research and documentation and, and um, commentary about this period of lynching, the violence that occurred uh, really through the, the, um, the 1930s into 1940 um, of black people. And, and today, when you look at the counties in this nation, that have the highest rates of capital punishment. Those are the very same counties often, not always, that have the highest rates of lynching. I practiced in Tennessee. There were five times as many lynchings in Shelby County in Memphis than there were in Nashville, Davidson County. And today, by far the largest population of the death penalty is from Shelby County. It can, contributes over 35% of the death row population in the state, even though there are 92 counties in Tennessee. And the population on death row from Shelby County from Memphis has double the number of black people on it than white, even though the population there is even. And so there is a direct link. And so when I thought about how, how uh, to be innovative and, and potentially challenge the, the death penalty, it's, it's to, it's to re-embrace the 14th Amendment to provide the equal protection of the law to black victims of crime. And what we find with the way that the death penalty is ministered today, it's um, the driving force is often the white race of the victim. Their, their lives are seen uh, as more worthy. 
And so if we were to extend the equal protection of the laws to black people, it's not that we would increase the amount of capital punishments, it's that we'd have to abolish it to really value black lives, not just black victims lives, but, but black perpetrator lives. And so uh, just to circle all the way back to Dorothy Roberts, I do think there is great utility in returning to the history, uh, the primary documentation of when these, these amendments were passed. Um, and I, I look forward to additional conversation uh, with some of the other panelists and, and everyone that's, that's tuned in viewing. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was very, very, very um, informative. And I think that I'm um, looking at the comments in the YouTube chat and I see people like, what book was she holding up? People are very much engaged and they really are, <laughs> they really are um, absorbing what it is that you're saying um, and some of the perspectives that you're offering. And I, I just thank you for that very articulate breakdown that you gave. Um, so if you possibly, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. DeVoe, and I'm gonna hand the floor over to you for, for the next round of questions. Dr. DeVoe, oh, you're on mute, bro. <laughs> you're on mute, Doc. Okay, thank you, thank you. I was, I was ill-prepared to jump in. <laughs> I was really still taking in all of what uh, uh, Professor, uh, I was gonna, I'm going to say Alexis. <laughs> because I, you call me Professor Alexis. <laughs> yeah, okay. Professor Alexis was really, you know, it, it just kind of just stopped you in the tracks to, to kind of think and make all these connections. Just remind me of, you know, conversation that uh, when we read about Frederick Douglass, and you know his conversation about these new iterations of the same thing remind me of uh, um, slavery by another name, wherein with the passing of the amendment, you know some folks have said this little piece of paper is not going to change the way I think. You know what I mean? In terms of some of the people that uh, emerged uh, that that benefited from these uh, notions of white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 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 Sophia, as a defense attorney. We want to bring you in and, and, and the work that you do regarding, you know, civil and human rights as a thought leader. And I know of your work uh, and the people that you have worked with uh, during the years and the work that you're currently doing with the uh, uh, Alliance of Families for Justice, you know, in their effort to, um, to end, you know, mass incarceration and empower formerly incarcerated people and their families. Um, in your work, you talk a lot about uh, collateral consequences. Um, invisible punishments. Um, what connections would you draw from your work uh, between the 13th Amendment and the punishment clause on one hand, and um, the things that we're currently seeing today in terms of the racial violence, um, the profiling, um, surveillance of, of, of black and brown communities, the harassment, the detention, um, also, your work with, um, um, the best way I can frame this is some of our freedom fighters. Um, how can the perspective and voices of family members and the neighbors of formerly incarcerated people uh, be brought to the movement to amend uh, the Third Amendment in, in prison slavery? Um, can, you, can you speak to that uh, a bit? Certainly. First, I want to say thank you to Kendall Thomas and to you, Michael, and Flores Forbes for inviting me to participate in. And I think before I address your specific question, I want to drill down a little bit more on the punishment clause of the 13th Amendment and the historical backdrop as to how that punishment clause came about. There was major debate and a downright struggle between the states that supported and maintained slavery and those that were called, quote unquote, the free states. And it was based primarily on economic advantage that the states that supported and had slavery um, enjoyed. And they didn't want to lose that economic advantage by the passing of the 13th Amendment. And so there were huge debates in Congress for quite some time. One of the primary leaders 
of the abolitionist movement was Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts who fought to not have the exception, to not have the punishment clause as part of the 13th Amendment. And those slave states fought to keep it. There were a number of abolitionists who lined up alongside Charles Sumner, but one by one, they started to drop off. And the debate got so vicious that while Charles Sumner was taking a break on the congressional floor, some of the legislators from the slave states came and beat him right on the congressional floor, leaving him maimed. So I think it's important to understand that history to, to really grasp how important, quote unquote, the punishment clause was to maintain the economic advantage that slavery um, created in certain states. It was not um, by accident. It was very intentional. And um, if we have any doubt about that, then we can look at what transpired afterwards in the courts. And I know several people have already discussed um, the lack of utility of pursuing court redress. I certainly agree that sometimes the laws and is a, an aid, many times it's an impediment. So if we look at the protections for employees that are contained in the Fair Labor Standards Act, all of the descriptors, all of the circumstances surrounding the work, the free labor of people who are incarcerated would ordinarily come under the description and the definition of employees as laid out in the Fair Labor Standards Act. And there have been several times in the past where incarcerated people pursued court redress to be paid um, at least minimum wage or fairly for their labor. And every single time the courts have denied the application of the definition of employee to them, although there's nothing in keep them from being protected by the Fair Labor Standards Act. So the, the intersection between the Fair Labor Standards Act and the punishment clause of the 13th Amendment I think is important for us to understand because it highlights the intentionality of why that exception is carved out in the 13th Amendment and why it is so important to get rid of it. Turning to your question about the collateral consequences for families and for people who have a criminal record. When someone goes to prison, their family members and loved ones do the time with them. We frequently speak about collateral consequences of incarceration and having a criminal record as it pertains to denial of access to housing, employment, education, public benefits. And those are certainly very, very important. The same holds true for family members. The lack of the economic um, income that the incarcerated person could bring to the family certainly is a, an issue that should be considered. The cost of phone calls, the cost of visiting, the cost of commissary, the cost of everything in the vending machine. All of those are costs that are borne by family members. Now I'm just talking about the economic costs. I haven't even addressed the emotional, the psychological costs, the societal costs, the stigma, the feeling otherized and being marginalized. So all of those are collateral consequences that um, combine to result in the disengagement from the community of family members who have an incarcerated loved ones. There's some very poignant research done by Dr. Hedwig Lee that focuses on the fact that people who have an incarcerated loved one are the least likely to be civically engaged. So if you look at the disproportionate impact of incarceration and criminalization on black and brown communities in this country, not only are the people who are incarcerated, disenfranchised, marginalized, and not part of the, the electoral process, but their family members back home are also marginalized and not participating in the electoral process. Also not participating in other forms of um, 
self-governance like block associations, parent-teacher associations, et cetera. And so you have a disproportionate marginalization of black and brown communities that roots back to incarceration, that roots back to um, enslavement. So those collateral consequences have to be seen in the historical context in which they were built, all built to continue the racist marginalization, oppression, and genocide against Black and Latinx people in this country. The 13th Amendment is just one aspect of the things that have to be overhauled, changed, and um, re reconsidered if we are to bring about true liberation for our people in this country. And I'm really glad that on this last day of Black August, we are focusing part of the conversation on this important issue. I'll stop now because I know we need to make time for questions and answers. Thank you. Um, I think what you just stated in terms of the importance of uh, amending the 13th Amendment and taking all of these other things into consideration as we move forward um, is a great segue into our final question. And this question is going to be open to all panelists and it is, essential that we that we address this question. Um, and that is, what are some next steps? What should we be doing? Um, what, are, what are some things that those who are watching in the audience, maybe who have not broached this subject before, those who have gotten their education regarding the 13th Amendment from this panel discussion, um, what are some suggestions that, that um, our esteemed panelists can offer them as to how to move forward and seek real life change? And those things can include um, going beyond or maybe even stopping short of amending the 13th Amendment. Also, quick plug, please sign the petition to amend the 13th Amendment at change.org backslash and slavery. And so that question is open to all of the panelists. Um, you're all professors here, <laughs> many of your professors here, so I don't want to have to call on anybody, but you guys can just go ahead and jump in. <laughs> well, can we can we go in the order that we started? We'll start with uh, Dr. Watts and then Professor Chip and uh, Professor Alex, Alexis and conclude with uh, 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 Sophia Elijah. And if we could keep our answers to about two minutes so that everyone has an opportunity to present. Oh, wow, this has been uh, a really great session for me. I've soaked in all kinds of uh, information. So I really thank the rest of the folks on the panel for um, you know educating me. Um, well, my view is one of the first things I'd be interested in is to getting um, if not a national scan, at least um, a partial scan of organizations who may be working towards the same issue or something similar to it. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, the EARA, others who've, who've worked on constitutional change um, projects <clears throat> and to not reinvent the wheel <laughs> and try to figure it all out first, see, uh, who are some people who might be useful consultants and have something to, to help us uh, better understand this. And, and um, the, the whole issue of that was uh, um, talked about by the, uh, I don't see his name up here now, and then I'm just I'm from Pittsburgh, about the issue of, of culture um, leading um, change rather than um, law. Whether in fact, I mean, I think we need to think after um, talking to others doing this work, whether that changing some words um, is going to get us where we want to go. And, uh, and um, Alexis mentioned, <laughs> when she's talked about uh, kind of how people use these um, uh, uh, amendments uh, to do whatever they wanted to do. And, and, and Mikhail, you mentioned a few examples of that. You know, the law is what I say it is, nothing more and nothing less. Um, is this the best sort of pinnacle uh, um, uh, uh, and ultimate uh, aim of, of, a, of a movement? I'm done.
Thank you, thank you. Yes, so next we have uh, Professor Carter. Um, what, what are some next steps? What can we do to moving forward? Thank you. Um, a few brief thoughts, and I, I will be brief. Um, so one, from a legal perspective, I think that as um, attorneys representing clients or the clients themselves, um, continuing to push judges, if that's uh, the lever being pulled, or legislators or policy making bodies to really engage with the uh, post-Civil War reconstructed constitution that forms our second national founding. It is one thing to talk about um, prison labor as kind of a neutral, non-racialized abstraction about um, equal work for equal pay. It's quite another thing to connect it in the ways that you all have in our conversation tonight to the legacy of slavery. And so I think foregrounding these things that it is all too easy to talk about as abstractions that don't have a racial history and bringing that racial history to the forefront is a part of the way of changing the cultural dynamic and understanding um, the deeply embedded roots of the phenomena that we see today. The second suggestions actually come from what other panelists said earlier, but, but two things really struck me. Um, Dr. Watts talked about the importance of linking um, uh, in terms of first person perspectives toward change, that is people who've been involved with the criminal justice system, linking their personal development with community development and giving uh, those folks a firm platform to stand on so they're in a position to contribute to their own liberation. That's important work that non-activists can do. Not all of us are frontline, march in the street, direct action people, but can we support black businesses? Can we open a black business of our own? Can we make sure that school children in our communities who in this online learning environment may not be supported or being supported so that their returning parents who have been incarcerated can work on their personal development? I could go on and on and on. But I think making visible to people who are not activists kind of in the street, this development of communities helps to empower the people most effective is something that I think absolutely could be an important next step. And last, I would just um, uh, uh, touch on what uh, Attorney Elijah said, which really struck me, that the people who have an incarcerated loved one, that is the people who have the most at stake uh, with regard to the conditions of their loved ones, are the ones least likely to be engaged in the political and civil process of seeking change. And, and we have to turn that around. Um, that, that just struck me quite deeply. I think we have to find ways to make those people feel that their voices matter so that we can center and put their experiences forward in whatever changes we as the relative elites are seeking to make. You tugged on my heartstrings there. I'm definitely there with you. And I, I felt every word. Um, Attorney Alexis, if you could offer some words of advice as to how to move forward. Thank you. Um, I, I have this conversation constantly with my students um, and I'm looking forward to this semester uh, co-teaching a class with Professor Bernard Harcourt called Abolition, uh, where we discuss these issues in a seminar setting from a theoretical point of view, but then we also have them doing outward facing external field work. And so this year they're going to be working on uh, two parts of qualified immunity. They're going to be doing some policy sort of advocacy and, and research, and then also working on an active litigation case uh, where the, the federal district court granted qualified immunity. That's the affirmative defense that a, a police officer, a government official will rely upon uh, for, for lethal use of force. So we're going to be working on that appeal. Uh, we have students looking at alternative remedies to, to harm, to, to, to get away from the carceral uh, framework into an abolitionist framework. H how else can you address uh, harm that's that's not an arrest, a trial, a conviction, and incarceration? And so they're going to be looking that, at that in the intimate partner uh, violence context. Um, and then we have students, uh, Professor Harcourt and I work a lot on the death penalty, looking at um, what is the next pathway to abolition at the state level? So I haven't lost all faith in our federal judiciary, but it's not looking so great after uh, the, uh, the, all of the nominations that the Trump administration has been able to confirm. And so we're having our students look at the state constitution and the state jurisprudence on the, their analog to the Eighth Amendment, Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual 
Punishment Clause. Their analog to the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. And there has been success in Washington State. There has been success in North Carolina. Uh, there was a, a failed attempt in Pennsylvania, but there is room to make inroads at the state level. And I think that's also where we can fight some of these uh, battles with law enforcement. We have 18,000 police forces in this country. Most of them are under local municipal control um, that, that, you know, the, the city council, uh, the, the county, those, those cities that have county consolidated city county governments, it's controlled by individual bodies, small bodies. And so we can really, as, as citizens, demand this kind of change, get rid of qualified immunity at the state level. Um, I could go on, but I will stop. So thank you. And for what a rich discussion. You almost got an amen. I'm gonna just give it to you. Amen. Demand the change. Demand the change. I'm loving that. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Attorney Elijah. So I think there's a number of things that I would like to leave the audience with. The first is that we must think outside the box. That we also must embrace the fact that there is no one strategy to freedom. There are many and a multi-layered approach that we must embrace if we're going to radically change what we know is the norm. I'll start in this country. And so we can't be bound by the limitations of our experience and what we've been told are the acceptable ways to bring about change in this country. I would also challenge us, and I'm gonna say something that's probably gonna be a little unpopular, but that's partially my claim to fame. I would challenge the fact that even in our own conversation tonight, the voices of the women who are on this panel have been laid to be last. That when we are addressing everyone on the panel, Dr. Hogan, myself, frequently are referred to by our first name, but our male counterparts are referred to with respect to their profession and their last name. I'm sure there's no intentionality in diminishing what we bring to the table, but even in our own conversation, we have to be mindful of how we've even marginalized all of us who are black on this panel based on gender. And I don't label myself as a feminist, myself as a realist, and I'm observing how the panel has gone. So as we talk to the next generation, I would say, be honest, be inclusive, and always think about how are the people who may not live on your block or live in your building experiencing the world that you're saying you want to build? Because if it's going to be all inclusive, you have to be able to walk in someone else's shoes. Thank you. Very well stated. And we very much appreciate your candor, your honesty, and um, being able to express the things that you expressed. I, um, in the beginning of the conversation, I myself referred to you as sister, and it's just a habit. Um, and so I recognize what you're saying, and that this is something that is kind of like the um, the subconscious biases that we have. Uh, and so the only way for us to correct them is for them to be called out. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, and so at this moment, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professors Flores Forbes and Kendall Thomas for them to give us our parting words. Good evening, everyone. And uh, my, my thanks first to the panelists for such extraordinary presentations and to our moderators for uh, making the conversation so rich and lively. Uh, I'm hoping that Floris Forbes will 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 show his face. Uh, I have to. Uh, He's there. Okay, yeah, there he is. Uh, we're 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 all negotiating uh, life in these strange um, uh, Zoom YouTube times. Um, I really feel uh, the the absence of our shared presence in the same room to have uh, this conversation because uh, one of the things that you've driven home for me at least so clearly is that this work is work that we're going to have to do uh, together uh, in concert um, and as part of work of community building 
and constituency building, uh, lifting the leadership of the women and men who are most directly affected uh, by mass incarceration and the exploitation of black work uh, that the 13th Amendment Punishment Clause has made possible. Um, in this age uh, of COVID-19 uh, and uh, in, the, in the face of uh, a pandemic reality, uh, which uh, has struck uh, the people who live uh, and are incarcerated at uh, prisons like Angola, it's really important, I think, um, to draw connections between the women and men who are part of the Black community that is in prison and of the Latinx community that is in prison uh, and the women and men and indeed children um, who are their families and friends uh, and loved ones. And one of the conversations that I think has been so important during the coronavirus is to point out the ways in which the racial character of American capitalism and the economic injustice uh, that is suffered by black and brown people has been thrown into sharp relief. And in the same way that that has been true uh, for the people who, for example, here in New York, um, have had to ride the subways, who don't have the luxury of working remotely, have to be in the workplace in dangerous conditions without the equipment that they need to protect themselves from infection. The same is true in prisons where people have been working, making uh, masks and making hand sanitizer uh, that they themselves are not being given to use. Uh, they then have to pay uh, to purchase soap for markup at the commissary. Uh, over 100,000 people have been infected with coronavirus in prisons. And there have been, uh, by some counts, the Marshall Project estimates the number of deaths at at least 1,000 deaths. So um, in much the same way that black and brown people who go to work every day uh, in the post office, in the grocery stores, in the warehouses, at the hospitals, here uh, outside prisons are considered to be doing essential work, but to be living expendable lives. The same is true of people who are inside. And the carceral politics of racial capitalism that the 13th Amendment Punishment Clause uh, makes possible is not just a moral injustice. It is not just a political and constitutional outrage. Uh, but it is a theft of black labor, of Latino labor, and of black and brown wealth. And so it is crucially important, I believe, uh, to see the harms of this 13th Amendment regime across a whole range of dimensions, economic, political, social, legal, constitutional, and cultural. And I wanna thank you panelists uh, for teasing out these different strands of the problem in such a probing and powerful way. Um, we are going to continue this work and we invite you to join us on November 13th for a national convening, a people's assembly, which will press this work forward and begin to actively engage some of the issues uh, that our panelists have discussed. Uh, in the first instance, as Mikhail DeVos said, our work is educational. Uh, the great late Black British cultural theorist, Stuart Hall said that the way people imagine themselves is crucial for political change. Uh, and one of the ways that um, we can reimagine ourselves and reimagine Black and Brown freedom is through education. So education is activism. Um, and in the, in the current context, it's revolutionary activism, uh, much like voting will be uh, in November. And we hope that you will join us uh, in November for an 
an online convening in which we'll discuss these important uh, issues uh, and think out loud and together and in concert with one another uh, about forging a way forward to create the change we want to see. So on behalf of um, Nefernity, Mikael DeVoe, Floris Forbes and myself, um, we wanna thank Sophia Elijah, Alexis Hoag, Chip Carter and Roderick Watts uh, for their generosity in sharing their thoughts uh, and the power of their passion about this important issue. And uh, we will look forward to a uh, deeper uh, discussion in the weeks and months to come. And we hope those of you who are watching us uh, on Zoom or on uh, uh, YouTube uh, will keep an eye out for Amend the 13th Movement uh, announcements on Instagram, on Facebook, and uh, on um, the Columbia University uh, websites with which we are associated uh, and join us for this discussion uh, about amending the 13th, not just as an end uh, in itself, but to make good on the unfinished project uh, of liberation for all oppressed peoples. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we will look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks again.